Liverpool, 1993. On a cold winter's day in February, two ten-year-old boys abducted and killed a young child. It was the darkest hour in the story of children and crime. The aftershocks of the case reverberate to this day. They decided to kill him. They didn't have to do that. It was a deliberate decision. At the time, there was, across the nation, a profound sense of sorrow, even anguish, about the crime. Nowhere was it felt more strongly than in Liverpool itself. I had nightmares for weeks afterwards. You blame yourself. You think, why didn't I say to them, lads, what are you doing with them? Again and again, the question was asked how such an event could have occurred and why two children could have done something so terrible. Some saw it as a sign of a society which had lost control of its children, others as an outburst of evil. The problem as to why it happened is something that will be debated for many, many years. Talk about a riddle wrapped up inside an enigma. This is a classic case of that. On the afternoon of Friday, February the 12th, 1993, Denise Bulger took her two-year-old son James to the Strand Shopping Centre in Bootle. She was a loving and attentive mother, and her little boy had all the energy and curiosity of a toddler. Shortly after 3.30 that afternoon, Denise went with James into A.R. Tim's, the butchers. In the short time it took to make a purchase and look for change in her purse, her son had disappeared. I was called to the Strand to take a report of what we call a missing from home. Uh, Denise was waiting for me there, and uh, she was quite frantic um, by this time and said that her little boy had gone missing in the Strand within a very short space of time. She had been there one second and then she looked away and he disappeared. This is Radio Merseyside. Concern is growing for a three-year-old boy who went missing whilst out shopping with his mother in Bootle this afternoon. We appealed through the media for witnesses and about nine o'clock a lady came, a very tearful lady, came into the police station. She was most upset. And what she described was two boys with another young boy who she described as James Bulger uh, on the um, the canal bank immediately outside the strand and they appeared to be mistreating this young boy she thought that it was two brothers who were fighting a normal occurrence and thought nothing more of it and that was the first indication that we were looking at something more than just a child who'd walked off the strand like any modern shopping centre was well equipped with closed circuit television cameras. On Friday night, Merseyside Police's Operational Support Division went through all the tapes from that afternoon. About one o'clock they gave me a call to say they had something on the monitor and could have come and have a look at it. I went over immediately from Bootle Police Station, which is right next to the Strand Shopping Centre. And when we actually examined what happened, you could see Denise when she arrived with James and you could trace them on various cameras, how they shopped during the day. And what you got from the cameras was Denise going into the butcher's shop uh, and then James walking out, just toddling out uh, and then disappearing. Then you got the image of Denise immediately, some seconds later, rushing out and looking up and down the strand for him. Denise is frantic. She's looking everywhere. She's asking people. She's, she's so upset. And she immediately runs off to the security. She reacted ever so quickly. She did everything anybody could ever expect a parent to do. James was being led away by uh, two young boys. Immediately then, it confirmed the witness that who had stated earlier that there were two boys on the canal bank. It then became very worrying. The police thought the two boys captured on video must be teenagers. Denise Bulger, seeing her son in the company of two youngsters, was reassured. 
At first, Denise was very comforted by that because it was felt that it's two boys, you know, what possible harm could come to James? Whereas if it had been um, a man or, you know, a woman leading him away, there would have been more immediate concerns. As dawn broke on the following morning, Saturday the 13th of February, the police began the process of searching the local area. The canal where James was seen by the witness, the warren of railway lines around Bootle. Once the Saturday progressed and the publicity went out and we felt that most people in that area would have known about the boy missing, then by the time the Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening came, I think of our own minds then we had to resign ourselves to the fact that he wasn't going to be recovered alive. Following the publicity about the missing boy, a security guard in Bootle decided to check his videos on the off chance he might see something. He did and alerted the police. The significance of this particular video was that you could compare the size of all three boys and the wall. And it was such that the wall, when we stood next to it, was so small, you realised that our interpretation of the size of the boys who had taken James was, was out, and that these boys were possibly a lot smaller than we had originally thought. The next day, Sunday the 14th of February, 48 hours after James Bulger went missing, four boys playing on the railway line in Walton made a gruesome discovery. I remember the phone call coming through to say that a body had been found. And really, you, you, you had no need to convince yourself. You, you automatically knew what it was going to be. We immediately made our way from Bootle to the railway line where the uniform officers and the local CID were waiting and had preserved the whole area. Uh, there on the railway line right next to the police station was James's body. Uh, the sight was horrific. Uh, it was devastating but immediately you knew it was James. To the police's horror it was obvious that the little boy had been tortured. His clothes removed, paint thrown at him, he had been stoned and beaten to death. His body was then placed on the line in a naive attempt to make his death seem an accident. Detectives say an unknown weapon was used to murder the boy before his body was taken to the embankment. But at a news conference, Merseyside police refused to give details of the injuries he suffered. I think it's very hard in the words of the English language to describe it. All I will say, it's horrific and it caused both of us a great deal of emotional upset last night. It was now a full-scale murder inquiry. Given the horrific nature of the crime and the fact that it seemed to have been committed by two young boys, the police came under tremendous public pressure to make arrests and as time passed, more witnesses were found. Morning. What's wrong with you yesterday? The police were coming down the rank and uh, asking us, did we see anything? I mentioned to them about them dragging this little lad up. The policeman said, right, pull your cab out, park at the front, come with us. David Kay told the police that he had seen two boys with a toddler come out of the shopping centre. I heard kids shouting, looked over, there's two lads, one of them's got hold of, I know now, James Bulger's hand dragging him up, and he just, uh, the kid didn't want to go. I just nasty thought, brother, being a little pain and that. So then he picked him up, literally dragged him up by one arm, held him, so his body was across him. And um, they walked up. The only reason I remembered them kept picking him up that way is because my eldest picked the youngest up then the same way, because he was awkward to carry. One thing I did notice, Jamie Bulger was like well dressed. These lads were a bit scruffy. It looked a bit out of place. By Tuesday the 16th of February, Albert Kirby and his colleagues had taken statements from a number of witnesses, many of them distraught. Together with the video evidence, the police now had a fairly accurate picture of the two mile forced march to which James had been subjected from the shopping centre to the railway line in Walton. 
but they were perplexed and horrified that young boys could have committed such a crime and decided to call on the assistance of a psychological profiler to help them understand the offenders. As the inquiry progressed, we realized that we were going to have to face the possibility of arresting and interviewing two very young boys. I invited a profiler, Paul Britton, to actually give a, his experience on how we should actually build in a strategy to deal with those. And the man was very, very helpful. He wondered if I could help to give them some advice about uh, what might or might not have happened. There was an enormous pressure from the local population for this to be resolved immediately. They were very, very badly traumatised generally by what had happened to the boy. Even though they didn't know the graphic detail, it had leaked out that something pretty unpleasant had happened. Angry crowds had gathered when police arrested and then released one young suspect. You must have him in there. There was what was amounting to a vigilantism beginning to develop and there were public order difficulties that were certainly having to be dealt with. By studying evidence of the abduction two days before, Paul Britton was able to provide a psychological photo fit of the suspects. He built up a picture of the abduction from the Strand, starting with James Bulger slipping free from his mother's hand. He had a detailed description of the route which the boys took. You can be standing in a very busy city street with all sorts of traffic going on and in the space of um, ooh, 10 or 15 seconds, you can go down a, a flight of stone stairs, you're into a very quiet, isolated world, the old canal communication system. And uh, there is evidence that they took the boy there and he was known to have been distressed somewhere at that point. 38 witnesses had come forward and told the police what they had seen. After a mile or so, the boys and their victim came to Breeze Hill Road and crossed to the covered reservoir. It was here that one witness had actually confronted the boys and asked them what they were up to. The boys that have James very, very deliberately explain that he's all right, that um, they're going to take him to the police station. You see their ability to front out adults and also to deceive. They're quite, quite accomplished deceivers by this stage. Deception isn't a problem, lying isn't a problem. They're able to deal with adults face to face without being uh, apprehensive. They know what they're doing. We make our way across uh, the remaining major streets and then we turn, um, really I suppose for the last time, away from the adult world and we go on to the, the sideways, the, 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 the pathways that run behind the houses and between the houses. And the uh, excitement that they are having doing what they have planned to do begins to escalate. And you see that in the continued abuse to the child as they reach the railway track. And finally they come to the scene of the crime itself and they then subject him to a series of injuries. And there was nothing to stop them. Paul Britton drew these shocking conclusions that this was not a prank which had gone wrong. The boys had acted deliberately. He explained that they had shown such knowledge of the area they probably lived locally and that they would now be hiding at home, afraid to go out. The police also sought the help of the Ministry of Defence who enhanced the video pictures of the two boyish suspects. When these images were released, the police received a huge number of calls. <laughs> We were getting information from many people. There was lots and lots of information coming in from witnesses and potential witnesses. Um, but we were no nearer to identifying those boys who were responsible for taking them from the strand. Our inquiries now indicate to us that in all probability both of these... Albert Kirby presented the media with further details of the murder in an effort to jog people's memories 
At a press conference, he said that blue modeling paint and batteries had been found at the scene. The forensic tests show quite clearly that both of them uh, have been in contact with James's body at the time that he would have been injured. Albert Kirby's information was crucial. On the 17th of February, a woman came into a local police station. She said that she knew a neighbor's son had been truanting on the day of the murder. He was called John Venables, and he had been sagging off with a boy called Robert Thompson. This was the moment of breakthrough. He'd come home and his jacket was full of paint. She didn't want to make a statement, but she said her friend when was sagging with a boy called Thompson, who lived near to where the body was found. The police checked through their computer records, but found nothing on Thompson and Venables. All the same, they decided to arrest the boys on the following morning, Thursday the 18th of February. At 7.30 in the morning, Detective Sergeant Phil Roberts went with three colleagues to Walton Village. As Paul Britton had predicted, the suspect lived close by the scene of the crime. Four of us went to the front door. It was answered by Thompson's mother. Robert at that time was still upstairs. So I asked um, the mother, I said, could you go and get Robert? I want to speak to him about the murder of James Bulger. He comes in, four foot nothing. I looked at him and I said, take a seat, Robert. I've got onto my knees so I could have eye contact with him, explain to him what I was doing there. And then uh, he just sort of started to cry, said I didn't kill him. Robert Thompson, aged 10, was the fifth son in a family of seven boys. His father had walked out several years before. Although Robert had never been in trouble with the law, his brothers were known to the police, and two had gone into care. At the same time, neighbours were surprised to see police arriving at John Venable's home in Scarsdale Road on the Norris Green estate. I was just leaving for school, if I remember right, and then a police van come past, a couple of police cars, and a couple of just ordinary cars, and they all pulled up. They took they took John away. Um, gave it ten minutes or so, you know, and he was. They took John away, and but there was a, there was a lot of police there, you know. They were they were down in force. It never really occurred to me that it would have been John. John Venables, like Robert Thompson, had never been in trouble with the law. His parents had split up, and he lived with his mother two miles from the scene of the crime. Following the abduction of James Bulger on Friday the 12th of February 1993 and the subsequent findings of his body on the railway line in Walton, two boys aged 10 years from Walton area have been arrested and are currently being interviewed by Merseyside Police at police stations on Merseyside. The boys were taken to separate police stations. Robert Thompson was held at Walton Lane, only a short distance from the scene of the murder. You were all of a sudden struck by just how small he was, how young he was. There was a, a squeaky voice, ten year old boy who wasn't really making himself heard in amongst the clamour of what everyone else had to say in the room. Um, yeah, you felt very protective towards him. John Venables was held in Lower Lane Police Station. He was in a detention room as opposed to a cell uh, at Lower Lane with his mum. Couldn't believe my eyes when I saw him. Looked like an eight-year-old, very small and very polite. And I asked him whether he was involved and he denied being anywhere near the Strand in Bootle. So, naively maybe, I believed that. And looking at him, I couldn't see him being responsible for it. That evening, the interviews began. Robert Thompson was the first to be questioned. He was a very aggressive young boy, very objectionable. Uh, very difficult to interview, didn't make any admissions, even when facts were put to him, which really he, he could not deny. A few minutes later at Lower Lane, John Venable's interrogation began. 
I would have been normally considering advising him not to say anything. But his mother said, no, he's got nothing to hide. And even if there is anything to hide, uh, I want him to answer questions. Throughout the first interviews, John told lie after lie after lie. He was never near the Strand. Uh, he was never been to the Strand. He'd never seen James Bulger. And he only ever changed his tack when it was proved to him that what he was telling us was wrong. That evening on the BBC Crime Watch programme, Albert Kirby showed the Ministry of Defence's enhanced pictures in an appeal for more witnesses. Good evening. Tonight we start with new details that have just become available on the case that's been uppermost in all our minds this week, the murder of two-year-old James Bulger on Merseyside. John Venable's solicitor, still believing that his client had nothing to do with the affair, was watching at home. The video was in colour and showed a boy who was leading James Bulger out wearing a mustard-coloured anorak. And, of course, the first thing I said when I went in on Friday, because I couldn't sleep Thursday night, uh, what colour anorak did you wear? And he said, mustard. Thompson swung his legs between the chairs, swung them to and fro, when he was either telling lies or got, I was getting anxious about certain questions. And when he started letting th things slip, the mother uh, prevented a lot of admissions because she used to start to cry. During his interviews, Robert Thompson admitted that they had been at the shopping centre on the day of the abduction. The police now told John Venables and his mother that the evidence of his involvement was compelling. She was very anxious to find out the truth. I don't think she believed for one minute, despite all the evidence, that John was responsible. And she went into a room with him and the officers involved, and she put her arms around John Venables. She then said that she would always continue to love him, no matter what he did, and it was very important that he told the truth. And then the walls caved in. He admitted that they had been to the Strand, but he, very tactile, emotional little boy, he uh, jumped out of his chair, screaming, hugging the officers, hugging his mum. He was very sorry. It was a very tearful scene for all concerned, the officers, Susan Venables and John Venables. Although he didn't admit being responsible for the injuries, he admitted being present, and that was a major breakthrough. John said that he only threw tiny stones, or alternatively would miss on purpose, prompting Thompson to say to him, Are you blind, Divvy? Each boy now blamed the other for the crime. Thompson tried to persuade me that everything that had happened to James Bulger was Venable's fault. That he was behind the planning. That he thought of taking um, James to the railway line. And uh, he just never wore. At 6.15 in the evening of 20th of February, after three days of interviews, Jim Fitzsimmons charged John Venables with the abduction and murder of James Bulger. I went down and charged him formally. His mother and father were alongside him uh, and his solicitor, and John Venables cried. And his mother was crying. That was quite an emotional time for them as well as everybody else. I went to Walton Lane Police Station immediately afterwards. And I charged Robert Thompson. Robert Thompson didn't say anything. There was no emotion whatsoever from Robert. Following tremendous public response, at 6.40pm today, Saturday the 20th of February 1993, two ten-year-old boys from the Walton area have been charged with the abduction and murder of James Bulger. Two days later, on Monday the 22nd of February, the boys were taken to South Sefton Magistrates Court in Bootle for a hearing. Media interest in the case was enormous. Television crews and photographers from all over the world came to Bootle to get a shot at the boys. Public anger too had been building for some time in Liverpool, both against the boys and the intrusiveness of the media. A menacing crowd gathered outside the court waiting for the boys to come out. Yeah. You're going to give his family 500 fucking pounds, are you? Robert, for one, was terrified by the 
the media interest and the public interest because he saw the two as being the same. The, the, the crowd outside the South Sefton Magistrates Court when he made his first appearance was probably about half reporters and half people who wanted to try and get him out of the van. This was a string him up crowd. It's almost as if rent a mob appears and there was a very large crowd outside public feeling was very strong on Merseyside and elsewhere as well but particularly on Merseyside as the boys left in the transit van bricks were being thrown people were running up to the side of the transit van hammering on the side with their fists the boys I know didn't like that one bit Come on. The public anger and national attention had a strong impact on the boys' outlook. Already deeply traumatised, each now became withdrawn, refusing to talk about the crime except when blaming the other. Certainly that kind of behaviour from the crowd um, will have had some bearing on how he conducted his case. I mean, it, uh, I should imagine it certainly had some bearing on his decision as to whether he wanted to give evidence or not, because he knew that would have been the focus of enormous, me enormous media attention if he did. Never before has a crime by children against a child caused such national anger and upset. To the experts, this was not so much a response to the crime itself, but arose from the very public way in which it took place. I think it was triggered by a very unusual visual image of the offence starting and I think it's that that was in people's heads and it's that that made the thing take on a life of its own. The video perpetuates the sense of helplessness, powerlessness and inability uh, as an adult to intervene in the start of what was a pathway to a young child dying. I think most parents and grandparents would be wanting there and then to intervene and to alter it. Everyone was prepared to feel that that child belonged to them. Then um, we know that that child, our child, has been most grievously murdered and terribly hurt. And so we then have a feeling of outrage. James Bulger's funeral took place amid scenes of great sadness, personal grief and national mourning. It was as if a blow had been struck at the nation's heart, made doubly grievous by its seemingly inexplicable horror. But for all its horror, the crime was not unique. Although mercifully rare, the killing of children by children under 14 has occurred from time to time over the years. There have been at least 17 cases since the war. children have both been abused and been abusing and murdering and hurting other children for a very long time. But I think we've often found it very difficult to face up to. And I think what's happening at the moment is that society is painfully coming to terms with the fact that children, a minority of children, of course, do hurt, do abuse and occasionally murder other children. John Venables and Robert Thompson were taken from Liverpool, the city of their births, and a place they had devastated by their actions, and put in separate secure units. Dealing with the boys themselves was immensely difficult. Both were diagnosed as suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, and seemed incapable of instructing their lawyers properly. He had his own Game Boy, I had a Game Boy. We played Game Boy. And uh, he'd say to me, you're not going to ask me any hard questions, are you? I said, no, not today. But I will eventually have to ask you hard questions. And then gradually I'd come back and I'd get a little bit of information about schooling, background, truanting, where you went that day. But always, can't say any more. Too hard questions. Over that summer, efforts were made by police in Liverpool, social workers and psychiatrists to answer one burning question. What was it in the background of two such unremarkable boys which could have prompted so dreadful a deed? 
John Venables and Robert Thompson were never considered potential killers by social workers or police. During the course of this investigation, I think we interviewed and arrested about 60 boys. And some of the background of these boys was unbelievable. I mean, boys who had committed serious violent offences at the age of eight years old but couldn't be prosecuted. Boys who you thought they are going to be very, very dangerous in the future. And I don't think from the research I did with the school and with the families that this ever became evident from either uh, John Venables or Robert Thompson. Um, there was nothing to suggest in their background that they could carry out the horrific injuries that they actually did. John Venable's neighbours in Norris Green were also perplexed that the little boy they thought they knew so well had become a killer. Just a normal sort of kid. He was easily led. He used to run in the street and if any kids in the street he'd throw a stone at them but run away. He wouldn't stand his ground. He'd always run from somebody and get the safety of his gateway or his house. I've often thought, you know, well, was there something there that I should have picked up on? Was there something there that we could have noticed? Was there something that was different about him? But I can't recall anything that was different about him. You know, he was just a, a normal kid. He looked out for his brother and sister. He tried to help them as much as he could. He fought with his brother and sister, just like every family does. You know, I wouldn't have picked him as a bully. But such children do not become killers out of the blue. To child specialists, there is almost always unhappiness in the background of young criminals like Thompson and Venables. They may have been abused, they may have suffered very serious bullying, they may have been very cruelly treated at home or elsewhere, and they often have problems with school and academic work because perhaps they're constantly distracted in their own minds, they are rerunning unhappy traumatic events that may have occurred at home and they're not able to concentrate on their schoolwork. It makes them look for another outlet uh, for doing something that can make them feel effective. Much of this was true of the two boys. They went to a church school where discipline and morality were central, but both were truants and had been held back a year. This home video was taken at a school party six months before the killing. Robert Thompson is the little boy circled. What shocks is his size and childishness. His family life was unhappy. A social work report after the killing revealed that his father was a violent drunk who had disappeared. His mother had subsequently attempted suicide. She too drank heavily. He was the fifth of seven brothers who grew up afraid of each other. It was alleged that they assaulted and tied each other up. John Venables came from a more secure home, but something was wrong and his education was failing. A teacher from his previous school wrote a report in which she described his disturbed behaviour, how, among other things, he attacked other children, hung himself upside down from coat pegs, lay under chairs and stuck paper all over his face. People will say, well, there are thousands upon thousands of children who have these negative experiences and they don't all go on to do this. And when they say that, what they are implicitly wanting you to accept is that there isn't really the connection between those background factors and this terrible event. Well, of course not everyone goes on to do this, because for many people there are other mediating factors in their experience. They come across particular teachers at school, they come across other friends, they come across people from other families that provide alternatives. The key thing about the children that killed James Bulger is that they didn't find those external sources of correction. They found each other. This was the tragedy. No social worker, teacher or professional picked up the signs that these two boys were out of control. Like so many boys who fall into crime, the boys would spend hours together out of school in their own world of petty thieving and idleness, shoplifting and hanging around in the Strand. On the day of the abduction, the cameras show they had truanted for more than three hours in the shopping center, even trying to pick up another boy before they took James. 
they would have started off with some sort of general conversation that had nothing at all to do with um, killing a child or James Bulger. Just the ordinary sort of boastful conversation that two youngsters have. And at some point, it comes to do with beating somebody up, hurting someone, killing someone. Oh, no. Oh, yes. And suddenly there's a, a dare in it. Oh, yes, I could. And there's something to prove. Well, how could we do it? Well, wouldn't someone stop us? Someone would get it. We'd get caught. No, we wouldn't. And once they are committed, they can't lose face. Many thought that John Venables was the weaker of the two and that Robert Thompson led him into trouble. But there is no evidence for this. In the first instance, I think it was Robert who took James away. Then John is seen hand in hand walking out of the Strand. And then we have the instant very close to where James was killed, where Robert is approached by another boy who he knows, and he says, oh, it's all right, it's my brother. He's always like this when James was crying and sobbing. So for me, the evidence suggests that both boys took the lead at various times. I think actions do take on a life of their own when there's more than one person involved. You get an audience effect. One feels the other and seen this um, many times in, in, in this case and in others and it does take on a life of its own and explains why young people or adults do some of the more dreadful actions later on before somebody dies. Nine months after the murder, the two boys now faced the full majesty of the law, a trial in open Crown Court. The purpose of the trial was to establish the boys' guilt, not the reasons for their actions. The case was heard 30 miles away at Preston, so as to avoid a repeat of the ugly scenes in Liverpool. Nevertheless, there was enormous interest. The boys were the youngest children to face trial for murder this century. Many thought it outdated and wrong to deal with 11-year-old boys in this way. On the 1st of November 1993, the two boys were brought from their separate secure units for trial. Both had pleaded not guilty to charges of murder and abduction. They were sitting on a dock which had been built up specially so that they could be seen properly. Um, they were sitting in a room full of the world's media. I mean, every square inch of seating space was occupied in that room. The acoustics in the room were terrible. It's a tall wooden room. Everything creaks. It was an effort to follow what the witnesses were saying, to try and maintain that kind of concentration and hope to instruct your lawyers at 10 years of age in those circumstances, perhaps expecting a little bit too much. What happens is that young people cut off, switch off, and I think for much of the time don't follow the proceedings in court. And it takes a long time to undo that before you can get on with the important work that the public rightly want doing which is to understand why and do something about it and ensure that these young people or other people are at risk of being like them don't do it in the future. I've had the experience of, of speaking with, with judges, uh, barristers, solicitors throughout Europe on this particular case. And I don't think there's any other system, certainly in Europe and in North America, that beats the system that we have of actually prosecuting and ensuring that at the end of the day that fairness is displayed to the defendants, in this case, the two young boys. As the first day of the trial ended, it became clear that the boys would not be cross-examined. Their lawyers felt it would be too traumatic for them to give evidence. For the trial to go on, the court had to confirm that the boys knew right from wrong. Eileen Vizard, a psychiatrist who had examined Robert Thompson, told the court that in her view, he did. But that was all. There was very little opportunity to actually tell the jury, tell the court, what my assessment of this boy had produced, what my feelings were about the reasons for him committing this very serious crime, what my understanding of the relevance of the background factors was, and how, in my view, it all knitted together to create a very familiar yet sad picture of a disturbed boy committing a serious crime. 
but no psychological evidence was heard. Instead, those who had witnessed the abduction were summoned to be cross-examined. All the press were there, photographing us as we're getting out, and that was terrifying. It felt like you were on trial. But when I was in the court, looking down at the two lads, they looked... It reminds me of my two lads. Innocent, wouldn't hurt a fly. They were just sitting there until you realised what they'd done. I won't forget their faces for a long time. I had nightmares for weeks afterwards, you know, thinking if I, only if I could have done something. And but, you know, you blame yourself. There isn't a day goes past I don't think about it. You know, you just got to live with it, basically now. We had to prepare the family because there was representatives of the family there every day. We had to go through a process with them to make them aware of what evidence was actually going to be heard in court that day. It was really was a very chilling and a, and a very emotional process to have to go through. Ralph went for the first few days to court and then thereafter he said that he didn't want to go because he was. He felt he was too close. He was within such a touching distance almost of the two boys and he couldn't cope with that. He didn't want to be that close to them. I don't think he was ever going to physically attack them or anything like that, but he just couldn't stand being so close to them after what they'd done to James. As the, the evidence developed in court, and then in particular then when you got down to the forensic and the pathology evidence, you could witness amongst the jury, members of the public, people crying quite openly and quite unashamedly, and so they should have been. The photographs, although they weren't the worst photographs, when we put the album together, still for the layperson, they were very, very difficult. And it was a very emotional time, obviously, for the, for the jury, because they had to sit through this, they had to see everything. The boy's interrogation by the police had been recorded. The tapes, all four hours of crucial evidence when the boys made their emotional and often tearful admissions, were played to the full court as Robert Thompson and John Venables sat in the dock. The two lads had to listen to themselves, probably some of the worst times in their life, they had to listen to themselves crying, distressed. Th this was possibly, although I've never asked him specifically, but this is possibly, I would, I would suspect, one of the most difficult things about the trial for Robert and, and, and I presume also for John. Three weeks after the opening of the trial, the jury retired to consider its verdict. On the following day, the court reconvened. For the first time, Denise Bulger came to Preston to hear the outcome of the jury's deliberations. The foreman of the jury was asked to stand. Clark to the court asked him whether or not he'd reached a verdict. He said, yes, we have. Is that verdict one of guilty or not guilty? Guilty. The emotion that enveloped the court was as great as it was at 9.30, 10 o'clock on the opening morning. There were cries of horror from the Venables and Thompson camp. There were cheers of delight from the Bulger camp. Um, the two boys had to actually come and face the family as they went down the steps and um, that's the first time really you got a good look at the faces and they seemed, um, there didn't seem to be any sort of contrition at all with them, it was all sort of, they were obviously upset but I, I didn't feel they were upset for James, they were upset for themselves because they'd been caught. I think Denise needed to see them, to rest in her own mind. She needed to see the two lads who had killed James. I think that was it, and that's why she went on the last day. John Venables, like Robert Thompson, had never spoken about his part in the murder, other than to say he was innocent while blaming his friend. He was absolutely distraught. Brian Walsh was our QC, said, Listen, John, the future's in your own hands. At some stage, you're going to have to talk. 
because the amount of time that you spend in custody depends on how you get on in the future, how you how you become rehabilitated, uh, and you won't become better. And he had to put it into simple terms like that. You won't become better until you've spoken. The boys were driven off after being sentenced to be detained at Her Majesty's pleasure. By finding them guilty of murder, the jury was satisfied that Robert Thompson and John Venables were of sound mind and had a clear intention to kill. These children are completely responsible for their actions, even though there are mitigating circumstances that help you to understand how they came to be in a position where they killed James Bulger. They decided to kill him. They didn't have to do that. It was a deliberate decision. They had the wherewithal to give him up at all sorts of points along the way. The trial had not sought an explanation why the boys had been motivated to kill. That remained a source of much speculation. Even the trial judge, Mr Justice Morland, put forward his views in a special statement after the trial that violent videos might have been a cause. It was discovered that John Venable's father had rented many such videos from a local shop, including Child's Play 3, a horror film about a demon doll. But there was no evidence that John Venables had watched it. I don't think that there was any evidence that one factor, such as viewing videos or such as um, truanting from school, so there's no evidence that any one factor is what did it, what caused these boys to commit a very serious crime. Rather, it's a question of taking them all together and understanding the overall picture. Over the years, some explanation of why two Liverpool boys killed James Bulger has emerged. That they were low achievers, lacking grown-up supervision. Left to their own devices, they acted together, egging each other on, and that a spiral of violence was unleashed which neither could control. All these things came together on that terrible day. But for many, there is another, simpler view. I've done a lot of soul searching and, and inquiring and thinking myself, and I'm now firmly convinced that children, just in the same way as adults, can be evil by nature. In this particular case, albeit that we had two boys who were different in personalities, that when they were actually together, they produced evilness to an extent that none of us would ever have dreamt that you could have actually witnessed. For anybody to commit the crimes that they did, I would say there has been an evil outburst. There has been an incident of evil. But whether or not evil behavior brands you as permanently evil is debatable, and I don't think it does. In the years since the trial, the boys have been held separately in secure units where they receive special care. Their families visit them regularly. Both must face up to their actions and describe in detail their part in the abduction and killing of little James Bulger. This is the first step on the road to their rehabilitation and eventual release. It's quite quite a difficult concept for people to get a hold of, but they 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 viewed their own actions in, in, in the killing of a young person, and that leaves them with nightmares, intrusive thoughts trying to alter the ending of this to make it end in a different way so that somebody wasn't killed. And in this particular case, there are, unfortunately, because of the amount of media attention, day in, day out, reminders. But those who suffered most, the Bulger family, continue to be devastated by the killing of their son. Denise and Ralph have actually separated um, since the trial. Denise has now got a new baby who's, you know, a lovely little lad. Um, but I think her and Ralph um, just couldn't cope with the trauma of the whole case. Certainly I think James's death and the actual sort of court case and everything had a big part to play in splitting them two up. The trial and sentencing of the boys remains the subject of controversy. In March this year, their lawyers won the right to take the case to the European Court of Human Rights, arguing that their trial was inhuman and degrading. If successful, the way the criminal justice system treats young children in serious trouble could be changed forever.
Meanwhile, Denise Bulger campaigns for the boys to be locked up for life. John Venables and Robert Thompson will leave their secure units when they reach 17 in two years' time and be sent to the very different world of the prison system to serve out the rest of their sentences, the length of which is yet to be determined. I think Robert would tell you that he's getting an excellent education at the moment and I'm sure that he's getting some of the best psychiatric care. I think my main concern is what, happened when, what happens now when he moves on through the uh, system to a young offenders institution and I'm concerned that uh, he isn't sort of put on prison at risk status, segregated from other prisoners and all the good work which is being done with him now is undone in those institutions. If the two cannot survive in the brutal world of a junior prison, they will spend hours on their own in the brooding silence and safety of the segregation unit. But the case of John Venables and Robert Thompson goes far beyond their dreadful actions as ten-year-olds and the question of how they should be treated. I think a society that can produce children who have those difficulties is in deep trouble because those children are simply examples of children at large and if there is a significant body of children who are so alienated, so isolated from the values that most of our community has, then the future has to be fairly bleak. The abduction and killing of James Bulger with its video images will remain forever a stain on the nation's consciousness. It was a turning point in our attitudes to children and crime. Above all, it showed that while the pressures of the adult world on childhood are ever increasing, children remain children, unformed and very vulnerable, left on their own they can go terribly wrong.